Well, greetings, everybody. We're uh, happy to have you with us here in uh, emanating from North Canton. That's where I am, North Canton, Ohio. And uh, welcome all of our brethren. I know we have a few uh, brethren from elsewhere that join us for the webcast if they find the time. Uh, I don't know that we announced the time for, for the Sabbath service today, but whatever the case, uh, we will um, carry on. Uh, this coming week, of course, is Passover and the beginning of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Just to, as a brief reminder, the Passover service uh, will begin on, it's on April 7th, April 7th, which I don't have, what day of the week is that? Tuesday night, Tuesday night April 7th at 8 p.m. Uh, will be our start time. Uh, then the night to be much remembered is Wednesday evening, April 8th, and we'll be keeping that, you know, in in our homes this year because of the uh, the virus is going around. Uh, the first day of Unleavened Bread will be April 9. We'll have a webcast from here at at noon, web, a Holy Day webcast at noon. And likewise, on the last day of Unleavened Bread, April 15th, also Wednesday, uh, we'll have a webcast emanating from, from here, or uh, maybe somebody else will be giving it, but uh, at least we'll... Uh, emanate from from this location on your on your internet lo connection. So, just wanted to get those couple of announcements uh, out of the way, and we're going to now ask God's blessing on our service today, uh, which you know the Sabbath service is in a sense at the moment a large Bible study of of sorts. But then again, when you look at our sermons on the Sabbath, there they are Bible studies. So if you'll bow your heads, we'll ask God's inspiration. We desperately need that. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and we thank you for the blessing of the technology that allows us to still be able to connect uh, across the state lines and up and down through the counties of Ohio and, and anywhere else where brethren happen to be connecting with us today. We're really happy to have any who uh, find that this is a good, convenient time for them or just want to be here to he hear this too. Uh, we just ask your blessing on the connections that the message will go through very clearly. We ask your blessing, most importantly, on the teaching, that it is clear and according to your word. We pray for your direction and guidance in our lives during this time of the coronavirus epidemic in America and elsewhere, and just pray that you will be with us and, and direct us this Sabbath day. So thank you for your blessings and your truth. Thank you for this knowledge that you have revealed to us, which we're going to be going into the scriptures to look at today. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. And uh, it is marvelous knowledge that we are privy to. Uh, let me double check. Was there any other announcement I needed to make? Mm -hmm. We'll have a moment at the end if we think of anything. Okay. Well, what we're going to do today is uh, look at another Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread preparation message here. Uh, this is going to be uh, a sermon, uh, but it's a fairly intense scriptural sermon in the sense that we're following along verse by verse through several passages, uh, because that's the best way to understand the Passover, what was Jesus thinking, WWJT. On the, the Passover, what was Jesus thinking? That's the title. And we'll, you know, what we're trying to do here is to capture a sense uh, from what he said as to what Christ was thinking. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know that that's certainly true for us uh, as human beings, and that's a biblical statement, by the way. Uh, we know it's also true from the Father and from Christ that out of the abundance of the, the greatest heart uh, is the truth. So how can we understand how our Savior, Jesus Christ, faced his final Passover? Now, we can hardly imagine ourselves in that position doing that because we're not the Messiah. He is. We aren't the Son of God, the Son of God. He is. Now, we will be sons and daughters of God, of course, uh, in, in, as the time unfolds. But Christ and the Father are supreme. So how can we best understand how Christ faced his final Passover, which is the one that we model off of for keeping the Passover in the New Testament era? 
There are two passages that give us some important, important clues. Let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 to start. Uh, and then the, the next passage isn't far off. It's only John 14. But in John chapter 10, we'll begin in verse 7 to capture a sense of how Christ faced his final Passover. Then Jesus said to them again, this is in verse 7 of John 10, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The door of the sheep. Well, sheep were kept typically in pens or sheep folds, as they were called, or barns at night, uh, especially during certain times of the weather in ancient Israel. It snows in Jerusalem nearly every year, so it's, it's colder than a lot of places, for instance, in the United States. Um, we think of it as desert, and we assume it never, never gets cold. No, no, it gets cold, plenty cold. Uh, so you have sheep that would have been put into a sheep fold at night. Sometimes the sheep were grazing at night, and the moonlit night perhaps, in the warmer weather, uh, then the shepherd would be out with them. But typically, they would be in their sheep fold at night. So I am the door to the sheep. There has to be a doorway for them to go in and out, doesn't it? All who ever be came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, Christ states. I am the door. This is the only way into the kingdom of God is through Jesus Christ. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out in and out and find pasture. In other words, the, the wonderful existence in the coming kingdom of God, typified like sheep in a pasture. It concludes that section uh, in verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. That's why thieves are there. That's their modus operandi. I have come that they may have life, meaning the sheep. And in this case, it's a new, an illustration of, of God's people. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The abundant life of living God's way of life. That gives us a sense of Jesus portraying himself as that gateway to the kingdom of God. And then in John 14, just several uh, chapters over, the first six verses of John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You know, some people like to say that when there's some, a disturbance. Well, this is where it comes from. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, if I go. Now he's saying, if I go to the disciples who he has grown up with, and they've grown up with him, and they're lifelong friends. And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. What do you mean? You're going? Where are you going? You, know, you, you can see the, the question marks that would be popping up in their eyes as they're trying to comprehend what he's talking about. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Now, as I said, they didn't all understand. For Of course, in the next verse, Thomas, and this is why we call him Doubting Thomas, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? It's not a very strong doubt, but it's, you know, a bit of a doubt. And Jesus said, a very, very critical statement for us to understand his role in our lives and in, in, the, in the internal plan of the kingdom of God is this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that statement was said then. It registered in John's mind as he was used to write it down, but it must have registered in the others as well as they thought about it in the times to come, the decades to come, uh, before they had finished their service as apostles. Christ is the gateway, the door, the gateway to eternal life in the kingdom of God. He is also the way in the sense that he is the, not only the path, but as a proverbial path, but the way of living, God's way of life, was the example was set by Christ. And that way of life leads into the kingdom of God. So Jesus paves the way, the gateway or the bridge, spanning the great gulf between us and God the Father. And what is that great gulf, as it's referred to in other places in Scripture? That great gulf is eternal life.
We are physical. We can't live forever, three score and ten, or at the most four score, occasionally a little longer, occasionally a little shorter. We're humans, we're, we're mortals. But the door is going to be open, and it's open through Christ, spanning the great gulf to be able to live forever in God's kingdom. Now, let's read how our Savior prepared himself to face and conquer the great trial of dying for our sins. That was critical. He had that penalty had to be paid so that we don't have to die ourselves. And for the sins of all mankind, it isn't just us in the church now. It was in the church all through the ages up to now of the true church. And it will be for every human who chooses to repent and believe and be baptized and grow in grace and knowledge. As God unfolds those eras of calling, some now, the few now, the bulk in the millennium, and then historical humanity, God reaches back in time and brings them back to a second lifetime, and then they get to choose. Uh, it's an incredible, credible offer of salvation. Yet you have to take it. It isn't forced upon us. We have to choose it actively and endure the challenges of keeping it. So let's look at the final Old Testament Passover. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. When I say it's the final Old Testament Passover, it's recorded in the New Testament, but it is kept in the Old Testament manner. Matthew 26, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass that Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover. The Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified in two days. Now we're trying to, to put ourselves sort of into the, the line of thinking that Jesus himself had. He loved life. He loved his eternal life. He loved his earthly human life. But he knew his date with destiny, which was already planned out, was approaching. That he had to die as a sin of sa the sacrifice for sin for all of mankind. Being a member of the family of God, taking on the human form, however, he could do that. That was all part of God's great plan. The Passover was the bridge, or is the bridge, to the kingdom of God in the sense of coming under the sacrifice of Christ, which occurred on the Passover, and it fulfilled the sacrifice that all those Passover lambs the Israelites had slaughtered on the Passover as sacrifices came to a specific fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, uh, verses 1 and 2, um, after two days of the Passover, I read that. Let's bump down through the chapter a little ways to verse 17. 17. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare, prepare to eat the Passover? Now that would be the uh, approaching time of, of the days of Unleavened Bread. And he said, Go to the city to a certain man and say to him, this is in chapter 26 of Matthew, uh, we're in verse 17 18 now, Go into the city and say to a certain man, The teacher says, My time's at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So Christ had made, obviously, prior arrangements for his Old Testament Passover with his, to be with his disciples, who were also his close friends. And then when it was time to be done, it had to be done. In Matthew 26, continuing in verse 19, uh, verse 20 now, we'll jump forward to verse 20. When evening came, he sat down with the twelve. So they came, and they were going to keep the final Old Testament Passover that God was requiring to be kept in force, and then it would the, the symbols would be shifted uh, in the coming year to the New Testament Passover. When the evening came, he sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Well, there was a bit of a jolt in the middle of the meal. And they were exceeding sorrowful, in verse 22. And they began to say, Lord, is it I? And he said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, they probably all dipped their hands in the, in the dish, but he would know when that specific dipping took place, and that's what he was referring to. The Son of Man indeed go, goes, just as it is written, uh, but woe to those, but woe to the man, rather, that to whom the Son of Man is betrayed, or by whose hand the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man not to have been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? 
And Jesus said to him, you have said it. And he knew that there was uh, this idea was already in Judas's mind. Jesus was man and God. He could read Judas's mind and heart. Now, before any departure of Judas, Iscariot, we have the next part of the Passover, the foot washing. So we go to John 13 for the foot washing. John 13 and verse 1. Now before it was a feast before the feast of the Passover, and Jesus knew that his hour had come, so it was in his mind, and that he should depart from this world, in other words, his human death, and then his resurrection into the kingdom, back into the kingdom of God, having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end, and he will love us to the end as well. He knew his hour had come. He knew his sense of timing. He knew the, the, that history needed to move forward, and this is the most important history that needed to move forward. So in verse 2, And supper being ended, and the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself, and after that he poured water in a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. These were Christ's overarching thoughts. His mission was soon to be accomplished. He was in infinitely higher in existence level than his human uh, brethren or friends. But no matter, he was happily and faithfully willing to serve their humble needs. Dirty feet need to be washed. Then he came to Simon Peter. Now we know the story, but it's good to read it again. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus said to him, I'm doing what I am doing. You do not now understand, but you will understand after this. And Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. You know, Peter was one who would make a flat statement right away, wouldn't he? And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter responds immediately, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. So you're certain you can't fault Peter for enthusiasm. Sometimes misguided a little, but he was willing to self-correct. That's a good lesson. Are we willing to self-correct? It's a good question for this Passover. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, thus it's a foot washing ceremony, but is completely clean. And you were all clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So we have this remarkable story unfolding when he had washed their feet, in verse 12, we continue, he, took his, he had taken his garments and he sat down again and he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. That's exactly right. But if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. You ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. When we talk about Christ's example the overarching example of Jesus Christ. This is, this is the summary of that whole concept. He, as a human being, he lived the correct way in every sense, never sinned. For I have given you an example. He is the example for us to follow. And you say, well, but he was a man, and you know, a woman might say, but I'm a woman, so how do I follow that? In principle, you follow it, obviously, just like we, we do anyway. I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is greater, uh, who is sent, greater than him who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Down in verse 20, most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So they would be going out, they would be forming the true church of God, which would replace in God's particular focus this physical nation of Israel. Now we had a spiritual nation of sorts, that is the beginning of the church, and they would be the principal founders of it, humanly, with Christ working through them. Christ taught by example, he taught by humble example, willing to serve even those who hated him, like Judas. Christ was humble and authoritative. Most humans are, are in, author, in authority, are authoritative, but far from humble. It's a lesson of leadership for us as well. You ask God for a humble mindset. Now in verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit 
And he testified and said, most assuredly, I know that one of you will betray me. So he's, he's feeling the sorrow. And the disciples look at each other. They try to figure out who's going to be. And Simon Peter then, uh, therefore, in verse 24, motioned to him and asked, uh, who it was of whom, whom he spoke. And then leaning back on Jesus' breath, he, uh, breast, leaning back next to him where he could speak to him silently, he said, Lord, who is it? Who's going to do this? And Jesus said, it is he who I give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. So this would be a timing when Judas is about to leave. In the other account, this is the time that he gave him the sop. As I think it's called in the, the King James. You take the bread and you sop it in the, the, the broth or the juice of, of the other food. And then immediately, Jesus said, to, just immediately after that, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, and he entered Judas Iscariot, at, who he had given the sop to. And he said, uh, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. And none of the disciples, as it goes on to say in the next couple of verses, none of the disciples realized fully what was happening. They assumed, because Judas was their treasurer, that Christ was giving him an order to go and buy certain supplies for, for some reason, um, but having received the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately. He knew what he was going to do. Christ could read minds, and more than, that, more than that, he could read the intent of the heart. In spite of that, he served one and all. Now, now came the time of separation, however. The hate-filled one would hear, not hear the rest of Jesus' teaching. That had to be a great sadness for him, I think, if he thought about it looking back. Let's go now to the events of the Passover, the bread and the wine. It will be in Matthew 26 again, uh, starting in verse 26, just about three, four verses there. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. So it was a piece of the bread. He broke it and he handed it to them. Well, why would he break the bread if it's breaking his body? Well, he was going to suffer quite immeasurably. Horrendous wounds, ultimately one, one major fatal one, and his body would be greatly broken. So the unleavened bread being broken apart, and since it's unleavened, it tends to break more easily than leavened bread. Uh, it, it made a good, good analogy, and of course it made the perfect analogy because God chose it. Now he says uh, he had given them the wine, and he said uh, the cup, that is, it says in verse 27, and he gave thanks and gave it to them. He said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant. Evidently, none of them had the coronavirus if they were drinking out of the same cup. Um, but Christ would have known that. Uh, Which is shed for many and for the remission of sins. But I say to you, in verse 29, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, after his resurrection back into the kingdom of God, then Christ will drink the wine with his disciples. Now, there's a certain sadness. His life and ministry was nearly over. These men were his friends and his brothers. Uh, in the faith, they were his students, because he was the great teacher. They were students, and, and he loved to watch them learn and grow as they had been doing. But it was very incredibly optimistic. There was a certain, you know, Sweet sadness there, but the great optimistic note of the great future in the kingdom of God. Now we come to the discourse that took place in during the dinner time, uh, as this, these things were unfolding. And so in John 14, turn to John 14 for this next one. John chapter 14. This is to Philip, one of the apostles. He says to the, to the group, he said, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the father and it's sufficient for us. Then, then we'll know it. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long that you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? My father and I are one. We're united together completely. So this had to dawn on, on the disciples. Dawns on us, you know. But realize as you're reading the Bible, the disciples were in a learning process. Even at that final Passover, they were in a learning process. That helps to understand the way Jesus says things that he says there. In verse 11, to summarize this, it says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves, the things that he did. 
but believe. There's a keen insight into the thoughts of Christ, and, and Christ is in the Word. As we have the Word of God in our hands, you know, the Bible gives us that insight. I've copied them down in my notes. I don't have my Bible laying here on the table. They usually do. Uh, but we draw that insight directly from the pages. Those words are there, written down, were the words that were being said back then. It is an accurate account. We can know what was going on at the time of Christ and the disciples. And we can identify with it. We can feel the emotion of it, where there is emotion involved. We can feel the conviction of it, where conviction is called for. And we can have that sort of forehead clearing dawning. You know, your eyebrows go up and, your, and you reflect more light upward uh, as the light comes down on your, the way your forehead skin is. Well, that's the dawning. Oh, I understand. We seek that understanding and we should ask for it every year for more of it. Let's go to John 16 now. John 16, verse 16 to 20. Jesus is going on with his teaching, A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. That was verse 16 of John 16. And then notice to the disciples how they try to figure this out. Remember, the disciples aren't converted yet. They don't have God's Spirit yet. That's not going to come until Pentecost, and this is Passover. Some of his disciples said among themselves, what is it he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and yet a little while and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And they, they said, therefore, what is this he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. You know, before God called us to his truth and into the church, or maybe your parents or your grandparents, if you're multi-generational in the church, but even then, before you were converted, a lot of the, the depth of understanding what the Scripture said was clouded in your mind. You understood the basics, but when you were converted, when you had repented and you had given you, your life to the Christ and the Father to be used however they chose, then you had your mind open when God gave you His Spirit after repentance. And you begin to wonder things more de understand things more deeply. Um, in chapter 16, verse 19, we go to now. And Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. He said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while and you won't see me, and again a little while and you will see me? He said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, and the world will rejoice. They'll be glad I'm gone. The Romans would. Uh, the Sanhedrin would. The Sanhedrin was the Congress of the Jews. Uh, they'll be glad I'm gone. And you will be sorrowful. Into the end of verse 20. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. He could read their minds. He could read their, he, he could read their body language before he even needed to read their minds, I think. He read it all. We strive to read body language, tone of voice, things like that. Christ knows what we're thinking. Chapter 16, verse 26, And in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray to the Father for you, but the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world, and again I leave the world to go to the Father. It's very clear what Christ is now making this to the disciples. This is the game plan. This is, uh, we use the term game plan, but because uh, we play a lot of games. But this is the plan. It could be a battle plan, if you want. The plan of growth, however you want to describe it. It's God's plan. The Father and Christ have put together. And his disciples said to him in verse 29, Now you're speaking plainly. Okay, now we get that, and use no, using no figures of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things, and have no need of anyone should question you. And by this we believe that you came forth from God. Now they didn't fully know what they were saying, but they did come to understand it. The dawning was coming, and that last statement was profound. You know, we're looking back maybe at the latter part of the, the apostles' lives, by this we believe that you came forth from God. Yes, they did. They could see the fruits of it. They could see them then, but they weren't converted yet. They could see them far deeper later. John, Jesus answered him, Do you now believe? In verse uh, 31, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, now is, when you'll be scattered, each to his own, and I will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I am not alone because the Father is with me. In the world, in verse uh, 33, the last part of verse 33 of, of John 16, in the world you will have trouble. That's what tribulation means, is trouble. 
But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I, I hope we can think about that particular phrase, brethren, in particular, you know, especially. Um, that God has over, Christ has overcome the world. We are in the process of overcoming the world through the power that he gives us and the strength that he gives us through the Holy Spirit. And to see the overall long-range plan that God has and our part in it. The disciples, it was beginning to dawn on them then. It dawned much more deeply come Pentecost, uh, but it was dawning then. Christ obviously also understood and understands human nature. He knows the kind of thoughts and actions that human nature generate, most of which is not good, but he loves each of us all the same. And we too can have that become overcomers of the sinful attitudes of our carnal nature and become very strong in the faith. Now, now let's look at the closing prayer of that Passover service, that first Passover. John 17, verse 1, and Jesus spoke these words. You know, this, this is the essence of the closing prayer, or an excerpt from it, beginning in verse 1 to verse 5 of John 17. He spoke these words, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your son may also glorify you. You know, it was soon going to be time that he would die physically on the day of Passover. The Passover had started. The sun is already down. At the end of the day, he would be dead, humanly dead, and buried. And he would be buried for three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, as uh, King James references it. It was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And then he was resurrected because he is God and man. God and man at the time. And he went back to his position on the throne beside his father. And there is where he is now. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory with which I had before, with you before the world was. Now, we can say almost all of that in a sense from our perspective except for that part. Glorify me with the glory which, you, which uh, I had with you before the world was. We haven't had that glory. Christ has existed always. We've only, we're mortal. We only had a start. Uh, but we look forward to being resurrected into the kingdom of God and sharing that glory that Christ and the Father also share. Now, let's look next at a few of the upper room comments. Um, they're in an upper room. That's the, the location. So these are some other comments that Luke recorded uh, with regards to the Passover. Uh, so is there some conversations going on? What we just covered was largely the formal teaching session where Jesus got their attention and then gave them the, the dissertation, which is mostly in John. Let's go to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, if you will. I'll try a little coffee here. A very fine coffee, by the way. Luke 22, we want to begin reading in verse 24. Now there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Uh, human, effort, human nature never changes. You know, somebody wants to be the greatest. And it wasn't just Cassius Clay who became Muhammad Ali and when changed his name. Uh, they're, they're, that's typical of human nature, pure and simple. Which of them would be the greatest? And he said to them, so Christ gives and gives them a teaching that should have set them in place, and to a large extent it did. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles ex exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, the great ones. And that, that is typically the way of the non-Israelite cultures. Sometimes that's the way of even an Israelite culture, but it's not supposed to be the way of the church of God at all, and it won't be in the kingdom of God. But not so, verse 26, not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. What do you mean, be as the younger? I don't want to be the, you know, the top of the heap. 
And he who governs as he who serves. He who governs as he who serves. You know, America has that written into its constitution and principle. That the government is the, to, there to serve the people, serve the nation. So there, there are inklings of it, but not a full understanding. Well, leadership is a service. It's not um, an existence unto itself. Christ and the Father, who have existence unto themselves, serve. They love us. They care for us. Whenever we're in a position of power or an authority of some kind, maybe on the job or within the family, um, at school, in some way in, in the community, on a ball team for even, even then, we should think of leadership and service together as God describes it. You know, you're not going to be called the great, the, the, the great one, the benefactor. Verse 26, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he who governs is he who serves. Again, this was being taught during the Passover service, the last one for the disciples. Why? Because they would be the apostles. They would be the chief ministers of the church at that time. And Christ wanted them oriented in the way that they should lead. So this has been the theory within Christianity generally, seldom achieved at all or to any measurable degree. It has also been the theory or the fact of leadership to God's true church down through the eras. We know how it has manifested itself in our era, not so much in this kind of detail in the previous eras. But we can figure that it must have been somewhat similar because human nature is still human nature. God's spirit is still God's spirit. He who governs is as he who serves. Governing is serving. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is not he who sits at the table? It's usually what we think. Somebody sits down, you start serving them food because they're the, they're the great one. And Christ said, yet I am among you as one who serves. And he just washed their feet. See, there's a tremendous lesson here as we come up on Passover. Uh, you need to savor this. We've got a few days before the Passover service captures, gets up, caught up with us, uh, a little while anyway. And, but then we have a whole lot of time afterwards. We want to take this message of the Days of Unleavened Bread and the Passover with us. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom. He goes on, that's verse 28. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me. What kingdom is that? It's the kingdom of God. We'll be serving within the kingdom of God. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So come, time, come the millennial age, when Christ has returned, the twelve tribes of Israel will be organized as nations, small because of the death loss and the great tribulation, but nations nonetheless, and each of the twelve apostles will be the king, the spirit king, over each of those nations. Now, what will we be doing? Well, we don't know. We know what the apostles are going to be doing, but we know that we're going to, in principle, we know what we're going to do, be doing. We'll be leading, teaching, guiding, governing, and, and helping others to come to maturity spiritually so they, in turn, can remain under the grace of God and ultimately be resurrected as well into the kingdom. In chapter, Luke, or Luke 22, Luke chapter 22, verses 34 to, 31 to 34, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Now, you think, who, who's Simon? I know all the other apostles, but who's Simon? That's Peter. His name is Simon. Um, his nickname is Peter. Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Why would he ask for Peter? Well, because Peter was going to be one of the main leaders, really the, the spearhead of the twelve. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that you may be, I, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I emphasize the critical words, when you have returned to me. What does that mean? Well, that means Peter was going to stray. And stray he did that very night. And there's a great lesson in that for us. 
But when he comes back, I want you to strengthen your brethren because you have learned something. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not, shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. You will deny three times that you know me before the rooster crows. There was a spiritual battle for the chief apostle. Satan was trying to corrupt him. And Peter had to learn a great lesson that night. Christ prepared him for the test. Now, this is a drama that we don't often think about, you know, when we're thinking about Passover. But this is an important one, a tremendous lesson for us. Let's go on to verse 36 here in Luke 22. And he said to him, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack, take that. And if he has no sword, let him take his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that which is written may be accomplished in me, that he was numbered with the transgressors. And you think, well, why do they have swords? They'd have handguns today, wouldn't they? Oh, no, they'd have swords. Were they supposed to use the swords? No. They weren't supposed to use the swords on people. But they had the trappings that they would be claimed to be transgressors. That's how they would come across to others. For the things concerning me have an end. And so they said, Lord, here are two swords. He says, okay, that's enough. You don't need any more than that. That ought to be a good lesson for us. Now we go to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, sorry. Garden of Gethsemane. There are many gardens. You've got to keep them straight, don't we? In Luke uh, chapter 22, verse 39. And coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. Now, if you're up in Jerusalem, to get to the Mount of Olives, you've got to go across the brook Kidron, which happens to be in a canyon. Um, canyon is a very, very steep defile, which is another name for a hill, uh, down, and then you have to go up onto the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is across from the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. So they would have to go down into the steep canyon. There, there was a trail, of course, uh, a pathway, even a, you know, a donkey path, and then they would have to climb up to the Mount of Olives if they were going over there. The Garden of Gethsemane was near the bottom, though, or partway up the side of the far side. So that's where they were, where we're going to go, to the garden. Coming out, he went to the, uh, to the Mount of Olives. So he was on the slope of the Mount of Olives, on opposite the slope of Jerusalem. And as he was accustomed, his disciples also followed him. This is uh, verses 39 and 40 of Luke 22. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Do we do that? You know, when you, wade, when you wade through the lessons of the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, but this is still Passover, this is Passover night, do we pray that we ne enter not into temptation? In other words, that we can avoid temptation. There are lots of, lots of important aspects of overcoming sin. One of them is the first step is to avoid temptation. The world is full of temptations for each of us. It's like a quicksand pit. We need to avoid it. You have the pit of church politics. And that was the one that strikes home sometimes within, within God's church, has over the years. In our modern era, I'm sure it has in the intervening areas because human nature is human nature. Oh, the pit of the love of money. And there are many who have given up the faith to find funds, you know, or to make a lot of money. The pit of adultery or any other sin. The pit of have, liking to give orders to others, power, rank, you know, that kind of thing. Those are all kinds of pits that we need to avoid, temptation being one of them. Going on to verse 41, and he said, When he was withdrawn from about a storm's throw, he knelt down and he prayed. And he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So if it's your will, everything in Christ's life as a human was predicated upon the Father's will. And so should ours. Stop and think, what is, what is God's will in this? And you think, well, I don't know what God wants. Well, if, it has to, if it's a matter of doing right and wrong, you know what God wants. Now, if it's a matter of, do I turn left or do I turn right, you know, where, to, to go where I need to go, no, that's different. But when it's, when it's an up and down decision, it's right or it's wrong, then we have to know that God knows what's right and his, he's defined that already to us. Uh, take this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, 
Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. So this is the prayer that Christ is praying. And his sweat came like great drops of blood falling on the ground. And he rose up from the prayer, and he came to his disciples, and he found them sleeping from sorrow. They were sad because he was sad. They didn't really fully yet know why they were sad, but they would find out before the, before the 24 hours was up. They would find out why they were sad. And he said, rise and pray. He woke him up, lest you enter into temptation. The devil's temptations are always present. They're all over the place. Billboards, television, movies that you shouldn't be watching. You know, you can make a long list of things to avoid in the world today, and you could have then as well. They're always present, but they must be resisted. And we strengthen ourselves in resistance to sin, which is one of the main lessons of the days of unleavened bread and putting sin out of our lives, the leavening being a type of the sin, you know, symbolic of the sin. But we need to have the proper shields in our minds in place. You know, and, and we need to be shielded from the thoughts of politics within the church. That's certainly always been a problem the church has faced, not just in our era. I'm sure it was faced that way in other eras too. And any other challenge that, that might come to us, rise and pray that you enter not into temptation. Verse 47, And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. So here, come, here came a crowd in the night, down in that canyon, the, the Garden of Gethsemane. They came as a crowd, and there was Judas Iscariot leading the crowd. He was guiding them to where Christ was. He knew that he would go down there. It was a, cuss, a place that he often went. And he said, Judas, and Christ said this is verse 48, Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And they were, what do you mean he kissed him? Americans, men don't kiss. They shake hands. Uh, but in other cultures, they kiss you on this cheek and they kiss you on that cheek. The Americans are awkward with that, but in lots of other cultures, other British are awkward with it as well. But other cultures aren't. Uh, that's that's a, a greeting. You embrace the shoulders and, and you bump cheeks together like that as a greeting. Uh, we just, you know, extend our arm out at a distance and they extend theirs. I don't know if there's a certain reticence in the tribe of Joseph or what it is. Uh, America descends from that. He said, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Christ understood that with betrayal. Betrayal is always hard. Uh, he understood it. If we ever feel betrayed, know that Christ felt betrayed first. And you can go to him. In, you know, in praying to the Father, you can be asking for strength in those times. Luke 22. Next is Luke 22 and verse 49. And those around him saw what was going to happen. They said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? He remember he had told them, if you don't have a sword, go and get a sword. Why did he want him to have sword? So he could be defended? No, no, he had a reason. A fulfillment of a prophecy, but it wasn't to put them in to uh, work. Shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. You know who that was? I'm sure you do. It was Peter. That's, that's recorded in one of the other gospel accounts. It was Peter who did that. And Malchus was the name of the servant of the high priest who lost his ear. And I doubt that Peter was trying to deftly whip off his ear like Zorro might. He was trying to cut his head in two with a sword. And not being a real swordsman, he kind of missed, thankfully, and he knocked off his ear. And in, when you... Uh, uh, when you come down in the next sentence, it says, And then Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. In other words, he put his ear back on his head. And it was healed instantly like it had never been cut off. Now the Christ is taken into custody. And I'm just summarizing over that. But that's what happened when you put the accounts all together. They arrested him. They led him on verse 54. They arrested him, brought him into the priest's house. And Jesus, or Peter followed at a distance, and when they'd kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard, they sat down together, Peter sitting among the, the other servants that were there, while the mock trial of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish council, uh, had a mock trial. We call it a mock trial because they really didn't have the authority to do that. 
And a certain servant girl, seeing Peter, as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. And notice what Peter did. But Peter denied him, saying, Woman, I don't know him. Well, that was an outright lie. You did know him. And after a while, another saw him and said, Oh, you were also among them or with them. And he said, Man, I am not. That wasn't me. You're mistaken. Second, second denial. And about an hour passed, another confidently affirmed, Surely this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Accent maybe, maybe their style of clothes, they gave away as Galileans, it's hard to say, or combination. And Peter said, I do not know what you're saying. Three times he denied Christ, just as Christ said he would. And immediately he was still, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. He could see him from where he was being interrogated and beaten by the Sanhedrin, the governing Jewish council. He could see out the door in the courtyard where there was a fire where the servants would be waiting and staying warm by the fire in the night chill. And he looked right at Peter at that time. Now, we betray God whenever we sin. Peter did. But this, this was particularly poignant and dramatic and profound. Immediately while he was still speaking, Christ turned to him, sorry, the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word of the Lord at that moment and how he had said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. That was a tremendous lesson for the Apostle Peter. It was a humbling lesson. And it was important that since he was going to be the chief of the apostles, the primary leadership of the twelve, that he be properly humbled. Christ was, knew what he was doing. He was sowing the seeds of the church's leadership there. How often do we deny Christ in our lives? By our behavior, by our thoughts, by trying to act like those in the world in a sinful way. You know, we need to think about those things. The lessons, the lessons of what was Jesus thinking is critical for us, or are critical for us, I'm sorry. My mother was a great, an English major in uh, university, so uh, I was not allowed to have bad grammar at home. And generally, I self-correct. I just did there, but I should have self-corrected before I spoke. I apologize. Uh, Let's go on to the Roman trial. Now we'll look in John 18 as we are getting close, uh, closer to the end of the sermon here today. I'll go a little bit over an hour, but not much. John chapter 18. Christ is uh, in front of Pilate now. So after the Jewish Sanhedrin, that was the Jewish Congress, uh, they're, they're in, the leaders underneath the Roman umbrella of government, now Christ was sent to Pilate, who was the Roman governor. So he spoke for Rome. And Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, so he, he, talked, he came back into the praetorium and there was Jesus. He said, are you the king of the Jews? They, they were saying that. He was. And Jesus answered him in verse 34. This is again John 18, verse 34. Are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? It's reasonable that he would ask that. And Jesus answered and said, and here's his answer. There's the drama, but here's the answer. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom isn't from here. You know, this is a statement that Pilate isn't going to completely understand. But we did pick up on something, because in verse 37 he said, Are you a king then? You can understand that. Are you a king? You a governor? You have authority. And Christ responds, You say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. But the crowd was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. They've been stirred up by the Sanhedrin. And so Pilate ultimately, their conversation ended, and ultimately, and now we're in Luke 23, Luke 23, verse 21. 
Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called to them, tried to calm the crowd down, but they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. A crucifixion <clears throat> was used on a, a stake or a tree, uh, or sometimes you, uh, if it was a stake, which was basically, a, a what do I want to think? It's a heavy beam that would make a great fence post. I, growing up in South Dakota, we built a lot of barbed wire fence. So we had to have good solid fence posts at the corners of the field. And we used steel posts in between. They, they can't bear much pressure, you know, like the, the heavy duty steel posts. But we would put beams in this big around good solid ones out of wood that didn't rot easily, cedar or something like that. And then we'd anchor those. Those would be the anchor posts for our fence, for a stretch of fence. So the crucifixion stake would be similar. It would be a massive, long, tall post. Uh, if there wasn't a tree handy, the Romans would use a tree otherwise. Uh, so they said, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them a third time, why? What has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Now, chastise him and let him go, you know what chastise meant? That meant that we'd be, straight, you'd be uh, strapped over uh, a beam or a pillar, and the Roman scourger would have his way with you. In other words, he was the man with a whip, a whip that had multiple ends, and into the ends of the, that whip, he would have stitched in bits of bone, sharp rocks, shards of glass perhaps, because it was meant to tear and rip the, the skin and the flesh under the skin. You, most people didn't survive being scourged. Only the tough survived. So he says, I'll, I'll examine him. That's how the Romans examine them. They do a cross-examination. They beat you to where you were just about dead, and then they ask you. You know, so uh, that... You'd be thankful you're not under Roman government right now. He said, are you a king then? He says, you say rightly, I am a king. This is verse 37, continuing. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There's a fast summary, and Christ stated it. But Pontius Pilate gave the crucifixion order anyway because they wanted it. They insisted in Luke, again, verse 20, chapter 23, verse 23, demanding with loud voices to be crucified, and the voices of the men of the chief priests prevailed, prevailed. You know, the Jewish leadership wants him crucified. Then Pilate gave the sentence that, he, that it should happen as they requested, and he was released to be sent to be crucified by the Roman soldiers. There was a time, though, at, in Luke chapter 22, a little bit earlier, being probably being taken into custody, where Christ gave a, a message out to the daughters of Jerusalem. And it's particularly poignant because it echoes through all of these events. It's in Luke 22, verse 27 to 31. And a great multitude of people followed him, and the women also mourned and lamented him. And he was on his way to, uh, to be arrested and ultimately to be crucified. And he said, daughters of Jerusalem, addressing all the women in the crowd. Do not weep for me. Why did not the sons? Well, the daughters did most of the weeping. But weep for yourselves and your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren and barren wombs who have never born, or I've never, who ne for never bore, and breasts that were never nursed. In other words, women who didn't have children because of the trauma that would come. And they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? And that was a harbinger of the battle for Jerusalem that would come about 40 years later, uh, from 66 to 70 AD, uh, where they estimate that 600, uh, 600 to 700,000 Jews were killed in the battle for Jerusalem alone, let alone the rest of the country. Jerusalem held out longer than the rest of Judea and Samaria held out in those days, and the devastating death loss. Romans were killers. They, they knew how to do what they did. That's why they had an empire. Finally, there came the time of the crucifixion. I'm going to look at verse 20, chapter 24 of Luke for here. Uh, there were two others, criminals led with him to be put to death, and when they came to the place of Calvary, uh, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand, one on the left, 
And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Then the soldiers cast lots for his clothes. It goes on to describe that, which fulfills certain prophecies. They put a sign up above the, on the stake that Christ was on, saying, this is the king of the Jews. And then in verse 39, one of the criminals who had been hanged, or were hanged, blasphemed him, saying, if you're the Christ, then save yourself and us. If you're really the Messiah, Messiah would be the Hebrew word for Christ. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. And verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. He said, do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, the world reads this, and yo, today, yes. You'll be with me in paradise. So they both died. That day. Well, that's wrong because that would, that's the immortal soul concept. There will be a day when that man, because God can read the heart, Christ being part of the family of God, he can read the heart of this man too. You will be with me in paradise or in the kingdom of God, in other words. Uh, he can read his heart of repentance. And so he could come to be in that time. What was Jesus thinking? That's what we're analyzing as we go through all of this. What, were on his, what was on his mind as the day of Passover came and he went through all the traumatic events, ultimately dying on the stake? Um, and we say stake, the world says cross. Romans used crosses with a capital T where it was at the top of the stake like this. They used crosses where it was like that, where it was the main stake and then part way up. But they didn't really care. They used a tree if it was handy. Crucifixion was one of the delights of bloodthirsty Roman soldiers. Uh, they would crucify on a straight-up beam. Thus, a stake is more appropriate than, than always referring to the cross, which traditional Christianity has turned into an idol, which they worship, which is a shame. They shouldn't do that. But here we have an insight, even, even down to the time when he is... He's in the process of dying between the scourging and the blood loss there and then being nailed to the cross with more blood loss and um, frankly a surviving significant period of time through the day in the afternoon, sign a significant period of time with that much injury and blood loss. It's, it's remarkable that he did survive that long. And yet he could still think of those who are around him and care for them and love them because he does love them. He loves us now. Passover is a great time, a great time and not in the happy, joyful, exuberant, almost silly sense. No, it's a great time in the profound sense of weighing and considering the sacrifice of Christ for our sins and for the sins of our friends and our brethren and ultimately for all humans. God's not done until he has given everybody the opportunity to choose the right way. We've got that opportunity now. We can't blow that off and say, well, I, it's not important. You know, if, if I don't get saved now, I'll get saved in the millennium. No, you won't. Not if you're converted now. God's called you now. Now's the time. It only comes once. So you start, it's important that we understand what Jesus was thinking, what he wanted us to know, what he wanted us to understand. What was he thinking on the eve of the day of Passover when he was crucified for your sins and mine and the sins of all mankind? His thoughts were thoughts of loving concern for his disciples and his executioners, as well as the crowds in Jerusalem that day. The Daughters of Jerusalem uh, oratory was about that. And his thoughts in his thoughts were all the generations of mankind from Adam to the last baby born. And we, well, we can't comprehend that. No, you, we can't because we don't have a mind capable of it. But Christ did have a mind capable of it, and he used it. His thoughts were also, though, upon us, the future generations of God's church down near the end of the age and all the ones in between. And there have been organizations of God's church through all of the eras of the church in the Middle Ages and the more modern ages and down to our time. We need to weigh and consider what Christ wants for us as his people. His thoughts are on us. 
he and God the Father were, their thinking was about the great body of potential members of the divine family that would expand the soon coming kingdom of God. And Passover is a critical step every year in our process of enduring to the end and ultimately being resurrected into the kingdom of God. So savor this Passover, brethren. Value it. Weigh and consider the teachings of Christ and the experience that he went through on our behalf and have a wonderful, powerful Passover. Thank you for being with us. And since it's a service, I need to uh, have a closing prayer. Uh, so if you'll bow your heads, we'll do that. Our Heavenly Father, we wish we could sing praises to you right now, but uh, under the circumstances, it's a little difficult. We'll coordinate that as soon as we can to do it. We do thank you, though, for the teaching of your word, the calling of your people to the truth. And it is the truth, your truth. There is no other truth besides yours. We thank you for the knowledge you've given us. We thank you for your great coming kingdom, which we desire to be a part of. And every Passover is a critical step in moving forward to the to your kingdom keeping the days of unleavened bread and the passover are critical to our understanding of constantly striving to overcome sin and to be more like you in jesus christ at your right hand so we thank you for this service we thank you for being able to webcast it so that we could all share it together in that sense and we pray your blessing upon our ill brethren those who are ailing and need your healing we pray for that too and pray for your kingdom to come father and we ask that special prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.